Well, good evening, everyone. We get started. Good evening, everyone. I am uh, Clark Irvin, the director of the Homeland Security Program at the Aspen Institute. Welcome to the second annual Aspen Security Forum, which it's my great pleasure and honor to organize each summer here at Aspen Meadows. When we conceived of the notion of the Security Forum a couple of years ago, the idea, in brief, was to take what the Aspen Institute does best, convening the best and brightest thinkers and doers, and then searching across the boundaries of party and ideology, sector and interest group, for common ground around the most pressing issues of our time, and then apply that to what I consider to be the very most pressing issue of our time, namely the continued threat of terrorism. The hope was eventually that the Aspen Security Forum would become the code to Homeland Security Counterterrorism Event of the Year for top level president and former government officials, industry leaders, leading thinkers, top journalists, and concerned citizens who care deeply about this issue. Your presence here tonight in this standing room only crowd suggests that we're well on our way toward achieving that goal. We're enormously grateful to our media sponsor, The New York Times, and to our sponsors, IBM and AGT International, who were inaugural sponsors last summer, and to new sponsors this summer, I2 and Mission Essential Personnel. We're also grateful to all those listed as supporters in the program. And finally, we offer special thanks to Tom and Bonnie McCloskey. Tonight's opening forum session is presented jointly with the McCloskey Speaker Series. As we near the 10th anniversary of 9-11, we can all exult and we all should exult in the killing of Osama bin Laden, needless to say. But the key question that looms large over the forum this summer is whether bin Laden's death represents the beginning of the end of the so-called war on terrorism or simply the end of the beginning. Uh, who better to start this week's conversation about this critical topic and related ones than tonight's featured guest and our moderator. And to introduce our featured guest and our moderator, I'd like to now introduce Chris Taylor, the CEO of one of our sponsors, Mission Essential Personnel. Thank you and welcome to the Aspen Security Forum. Good evening. Uh, on behalf of the 8,300 men and women of Mission Essential Personnel, who as we gather here tonight are serving in 16 countries around the world, the majority of whom are in harm's way, I'd like to add my welcome to Clark's, to everyone, uh, to the Aspen Security Forum. It is a distinct pleasure for me to introduce uh, this evening's moderator and her victim. Um, it will be, uh, no doubt, a wonderful discussion. Moderating this evening's uh, discussion is Martha Raditz, who is currently the Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent for ABC News. Um, you no doubt see Martha's work on um, all of ABC News's major uh, broadcasts. Before that, she was the Chief War, uh, White House Correspondent for ABC News. She joined ABC in 1999 as a State Department Correspondent and in 2003 became the Senior National Security Correspondent. Um, in that position, in 2006, she exclusively broke that the United States had located and killed um, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Um, from 93 to 98, she covered the Pentagon for NPR. And the interesting thing about uh, Martha is that um, she has been a war correspondent as well as a foreign affairs correspondent. So she provides uh, all of us insight from Washington, D.C., which has its own cacophony, and also from the war zone, which has a different cacophony. Um, in addition to her numerous journalism awards, she's the author of the New York Times and Washington Post bestseller, The Long Road Home, about the war in Sadr City, Iraq. This evening, her victim is the commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, Admiral Eric T. Olson. The I'd like to point out that the T stands for Thor, and it is the coolest name in special operations you could possibly have. <laughs> you just can't get any cooler than that. Admiral Olson graduated from the Naval Academy in 1973. He graduated from Bud's class 76 in 1974. Um, he has commanded at all levels in the SEAL community to include a Naval Special Warfare Group, 
uh, Development Group and Naval Special Warfare Command. Uh, of his many awards, he is a recipient of the Silver Star for his uh, service in Mogadishu in 1993 and a Bronze Star with a Combat V. Um, he holds a Master of Arts in National Security Affairs from the uh, Naval Postgraduate School. He is the first SEAL three star. He is the first SEAL four star. He is the first SEAL commander of Special Operations Command. And he still holds uh, the moniker Bullfrog, which is given to the longest serving SEAL on active duty. Aristotle wrote that at the Olympics, it's not the finest and the strongest men who are crowned, but they who enter the lists. And it's from those that we choose the, uh, the prize men. So too, uh, in life, of the honorable and the good. Those who act rightly win the prize. 38 years ago, Admiral Olson entered the lists and every day since has been nobly and honorably serving our nation. Please join me in welcoming both Martha and Admiral Olson to the stage. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here in Aspen. It's so much better to be in Aspen than, say, Afghanistan. But that uh, introduction reminds me that it's also better to be in Afghanistan than Washington, D.C., <laughs> especially right now. Uh, I am so happy to hear the great biography of Admiral Olson, which I have been poring over facts, and I found a few that you didn't mention. And that is, he was born to be a Navy SEAL. When he was a little boy, he'd go swimming with his knife, and that's how he could kill fish if you believe everything you read in the Tacoma Press. <laughs> he also made his first wetsuit when he was nine years old out of scraps of rubber. Why do I know this? Because if you put in Eric Olson, Bin Laden, and his hometown of Tacoma, this comes up in the headlines. Tacoma plays its part in Osama Bin Laden raid. <laughs> or my favorite. Tacoma mom gushes about son's role in finding Osama bin Laden. <laughs> she is beautiful, by the way. His mother's beautiful. But a few things, I was eagerly reading this saying, he must have called her. He must have told her everything about the raid. He told her nothing. In fact, he didn't call her for four days after the raid. She really didn't know anything about it, and he called her to tell her when his retirement ceremony would be taking place, essentially. This is what she said. To Eric, she said, it occurred, it was successful, and now we're on to today. Now, we're hoping to get a bit more <laughs> than that from him tonight, but I am going to tell you right off the bat that Admiral Olson has had a career, a successful career as a Navy SEAL, because he's kept his mouth shut. So I know this is not a forum he is used to. We have talked in advance. This is how far I got in an off-the-record session, which he's now allowed me to talk about what he said in that off-the-record session. I started talking about drone strikes in Pakistan, and he said, are you talking about unattributed explosions? So the idea that he's my victim tonight, or that I could take down a Navy SEAL, I'm pretty good, but not that good. <laughs> but he has had an extraordinary career, and what I do hope we can hear a lot about, and I know he's going to start off a little bit telling us as much as he can about the Osama bin Laden raid, but really the future of special operations. When you think back on this country in the last 10 years and how special operations has changed, how it's grown, 32,000 I think 10 years ago, more than 60,000 now and still growing. So Admiral Olson, I'll turn it over to you. I know you want to make a few comments to begin with. Uh, and if you want to just transition into that raid without me asking you again or you know, trying even harder, please do. Thanks. Thank you, Martha, and uh, Clark and Chris, and uh, th thank you so much. I, I do appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you. I know many of you, former colleagues and friends uh, who are here, and it's very good to be with you I, uh, for all the right reasons, as you can imagine, one of which I'm not here from Washington. I'm here from Tampa, Florida, 
and Tampa at the end of July is a good place to escape from to get to Aspen, and uh, so, so that's one reason. Uh, but I, 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 Martha's right, I don't, uh, first of all, Martha, I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, we in uniform have a great deal of respect for you, and when I found out that you were the moderator uh, this evening, I was really quite pleased. That's so. why you came, right? Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, but I accepted this one, one, because of the nature of the forum and, uh, and who is here and how important you all are, but also because I am going to be leaving service here before long, and, and uh, as I back out, I, I do want to take the opportunity to share with you some of what I think America should know about the special operations community that it has built over the last 25 years, where it fits in, what it does, and, uh, and how we see the world of the future and how we fit into that. And so I'll get into that. I want this to be a conversation about that. Um, so please, um, please scratch into me as deep as you want on, on any of that. Uh, up front, I want to say uh, that, that this is a, a fantastic community. It's grown. Uh, it has expanded its capabilities. It is a microcosm of the Department of Defense. Uh, the United States Special Operations Community is Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Active Reserve, Guard, Government, Civilian, Contractor. It operates from the tropics to the Arctic, from below the surface to space, uh, and a mission set that is much broader than you might imagine. And I'd like to scratch into that uh, tonight as well. Most people, when they hear about the Special Operations Community, uh, They've either been exposed through a book or a movie or a headline about something spectacular. Uh, but it's a far more nuanced uh, community than that. And, and what they do today in about 65 countries around the world in combat in only two of them uh, it is a pretty good story as well. And, and, and so when we do talk about this new normal, this, uh, this future world that we anticipate living in over the next a uh, few decades, then, uh, th then it, it, th the special operations community is quite well uh, suited to that. I will talk about uh, the bin Laden raid, but not much. Um, uh, the Department of Defense has not acknowledged uh, the participation of any particular unit or any particular individual in that raid, and I respect that. I applaud it. I thank Secretary Gates and, uh, and Chairman Mullen for uh, for their public statements that we have already spoken too much about that raid. And, and so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go into the tactical details and I'm certainly not gonna break faith uh, with my own community at, at this point now or ever uh, in terms of, uh, of, of what it would mean to them uh, to talk too much about it. Uh, for the special operations community, I would say that the 15 minutes of fame lasted at least 14 minutes too long. And they, they really just want to get back into the shadows and do what they came in to do. And, uh, and I would also say I accepted this invitation before the bin Laden raid occurred, so, uh, so that wasn't part of the original plan. But can I just um, say, and I know you don't want to acknowledge this either, but it's been publicly talked about that you that evening were with Leon Panetta at CIA headquarters. So f if, if you'll talk a little bit about just your whether it's your pride, whether it's watching, whether it's the drama of watching that, if you'll talk about the raid in those terms. Oh, well, I'll, there, there, I'll make um, five points, I think. Uh, first is that this raid would not have been as successful um, if not for the interagency collaboration that has occurred over the last few years. This was the intelligence community and the military operational community coming together in a very powerful way, an unprecedented way, I would say, at least in, in modern history, uh, so that when it came to the president for a decision, um, he, had, he had enough confidence that the intelligence piece of this was great and the military capabilities uh, were great and that this was being presented to him as one team, not two parallel efforts brought together at the end. And, uh, and, and I don't think that would have been possible more than a few years ago. In fact, I think the operations of, of recent years have caused what I would call second and third generation contact uh, between the intelligence agencies and the special operations community and people who work together in the field as youngsters are now 10 years later working together in headquarters uh, with barriers between the organizations completely torn down. So this is a, this is a very positive thing and one that, that we can all be very proud of. Two, 
Um, I don't think it would have been possible without the jointness, the, the military joint uh, community together, services being interoperable, able to work together, comfortable uh, working with each other. And I don't mean just inside the special operations community, but all the organizations that were on the fringe of this and supporting this, uh, who, had to, who had to sort of flow into the river um, without trauma in order to bring all of this together at a, at a very high level. Third, and this is going to sound very, very parochial, uh, but I don't think it would have been possible had the nation not created its special operations community uh, 25 years ago. The decisions that, in my view, led to the real success in this raid were not made this year or last year. They were made 12 to 15 years ago. The investments in the equipment, the night vision compatibility in the cockpits, the experimental uh, aircraft, the People who were in this uh, mission were for the most part 12 to 15 to 17 years in service. They came under recruiting programs and training programs uh, that built this up over time into what it is. And that's my message to, uh, to other nations on this, is if they want to have this capability in 15 years, they better start now. And uh, we started it 25 uh, years ago in the aftermath of a failed attempt by this nation to put a ground force in helicopters and fly them uh, into a hostile environment. And uh, it was an operation that ended in disaster at a place known then as, and now as Desert One, attempting to rescue hostages in Tehran. And, and that was really the catalyst for the development of the Special Operations Committee. Fourth, I would say that this is not a failure at Desert One, and then you fast forward a few years, and you're at Black Hawk Down, and then you fast forward a few years, and you're on the Bin Laden raid, uh, there were somewhere between three and 4,000, depending on how you count them, operations of this nature conducted in 2010 alone. Uh, this, is, this is now routine. Every night, um, dozens of times, um, or at least I would say a dozen-ish a dozen missions a night, uh, ground forces getting on a helicopter and flying against a target. Uh, to do something on that target. In many cases, just knock on the door and invite somebody to give themselves up. In some cases, it is to conduct a, a more kinetic action. But this has become habit uh, for the forces, and, and the forces that uh, participated in this particular operation have <laughs> celebrated their greatest successes together and mourned their most severe losses together uh, over the last few years. So there's a, there's a respect within this uh, community born out of uh, of the rapidity of the uh, the, the uh, routineness of these operations over the last few years, and then fifth, um, it was successful because nobody talked about it. Nobody talked about it before, and if we want to preserve this capability, we shouldn't talk about it after. I mean, in terms of the people, the tactics, the techniques, the advanced technologies. Um, sort of how it all came together, uh, we can give that up by, by talking about it too much. And if I was an Al-Qaeda targeteer, I would be paying very close attention uh, to who's talking about it and what they're saying. And, and I certainly don't, uh, don't want to be the example of the guy who talks too much about it. I don't, uh, I don't think there's any danger of that so far. There, there, <laughs> are, there are people at risk. There are families at risk. Uh, there are units at risk, there are capabilities at risk. And, uh, and so I would just ask that as we go through the evening, we respect that. Clearly. Um, but one thing I want to, ca can you talk about from your point of view that evening, and however you say, let's go back to point number four, whatever you say about routine and how often you do this, this was different. This was Osama bin Laden. And from your perspective, what you can talk about, and for those highly trained teams, how you overcome that. How you overcome the fact that this is the big one? Well, I think the excitement about all that was not at the team level. It was way above the team level. I mean, there's the, the tactics of this thing were routine. The people involved in it do it all the time. That night, if you use the rough number of a dozen missions, 11 went left and one went right. Uh, but for the, the people involved, it was another mission on another target. And yes, they understood that it was a more important target, uh, but it's they're always trying to do it the best they can, and they want to do this one the best they could. The, most of the excitement was all around the edges. I mean, it was the strategic value of this and what 
might happen to national prestige should it go wrong and how are you going to talk about it if it goes right and who are you going to inform? I mean, it was all of that. Um, so well, you talk about but, Desert but, but One. That, you, there were lessons learned, obviously, yeah. from that. And those lessons, one of them being get back up helicopters, correct? Mm -hmm. So what other lessons did you gather from Desert One that were used in this? Uh, Desert One was uh, 31 years ago. Um, or from Black Hawk Down, or from anything over the years. Yeah, I mean, I, in, in, it's not, like I said, this is not a force that sits on the second deck of the fire station waiting for the bell to ring every 10 or 15 years. <laughs> the, this is a force that every day is better than it was the day before. Uh, so you, we don't trace our lessons back to that event or the other event. We trace our lessons back to what we did last night. And so I, I don't mean to give a lame answer on that, but. Um, but it's really not the lesson learned from Black Hawk Down or Desert One. It's the lesson learned, the lessons learned continuously over 10 years of combat uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq. One of the things we've been reading a lot about, and we also had Secretary Panetta, I, I think within his first couple of days on the job, talk about the defeat of Al-Qaeda and that the U.S. is near strategic defeat of Al-Qaeda. I think there was an article in the Washington Post today also quoting counterterrorism officials saying that Al-Qaeda is almost done. And I think we're talking about Al-Qaeda in Pakistan, obviously. So your thoughts on that? Uh, al almost isn't good enough. Um, I think, and I'll use kind of a boxing analogy, I think that, um, that we jabbed away at um, Al-Qaeda for several years and we got them winded and bloody, but, but still fighting. And then uh, I think the Arab Spring was a roundhouse that just knocked the wind out of them. It took away the ideological message that you need violence to overthrow a government. And there were more governments overthrown in the first few months of this year relatively nonviolently than Al-Qaeda had overthrown in its entire existence. So I think that they lost steam as a result of the Arab Spring. And then I think the, the death of bin Laden was the uppercut to the jaw, and it just knocked them on their heels. And, and although they had a succession plan in place, it wasn't rapidly executed in Zawahiri hasn't really exercised his sort of full authority of the position and, and so we have to watch that very carefully to see what Al-Qaeda becomes. I do believe that sort of Al-Qaeda version 1.0 um, is nearing its end, but I'm very concerned of what, about what Al-Qaeda version 2.0 will be. Uh, it will morph, it will disperse, it will become I think in some ways more westernized, dual passport holders, uh, more emergent leaders in more places uh, over time. And, uh, and I think they're refining their message in a way against real difficulties, but trying hard to refine their message in a way that, uh, that, we'll, that will appeal to a broader audience. And when, when I think about that, and, and if you say Al-Qaeda uh, 1.0, do we really understand what the next generation of Al-Qaeda will be? I, ca I, I can't help thinking no one knew 10 years ago that someone was going to fly airplanes into buildings. So when you think about that and you think about the, uh, all the possibilities and what will happen to Al-Qaeda, what, what's your greatest fear, challenge, how to get at that? And my, my greatest, I'm not going to say what my greatest fear is because Al-Qaeda might be taking notes and I, and I don't want them to, uh, to act out my greatest fear. Um, but I do think that they will continue to need places to operate from. They will continue to need sanctuary and they will go where the sanctuary is, uh, where there are undergoverned or ungoverned spaces, where airports are less secure, where borders are more porous and in order for Al-Qaeda to survive in the way it wants to. Uh, to, to be a transnational uh, kind of an organization, we'll have to pursue that. And uh, in order to have freedom of movement in the way that they intend to have it, uh, they will have to, have to find a way to get through, to get past in increasing security uh, that's being established to keep them from doing that. So, uh, so I'm concerned that, uh, that they're focused on that, but, um, but we'll see how quickly they learn those lessons. Do you have any sense of any differences with Zawahiri, what direction he'll take it? Why? You said you think he's, he's I don't, I, did you say struggling, uh, doesn't quite know what he's doing yet? 
or how that will be different. Well, I, 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 he's just not as charismatic, so he hasn't asserted the leadership role that uh, he hasn't. He hasn't become a one-for-one -one replacement uh, for Bin Laden, and uh, and he may have acknowledged that he won't be that. Uh, so that's my question about what will Al Qaeda be in its, in its next version. We're asking the same question. Let's, let's go back to special operations. Talk about the differences from ten years ago, the growth, the training and really the stress on the force as well. Yeah, our, our, uh, the, the, the force is, I'll just throw some numbers at you and you may or may not care, but the force has doubled in its size uh, from about 32,000 to 60,000 people. That's a significant force. The Special Operations Command is now larger than the U.S. Coast Guard. Well, we're about the size of the Canadian Defense Forces. This is about one-third of it, about 20,000 people who are careerists in special operations. These are people who have volunteered several times, uh, been selected and trained to a level that earned them the badge or the beret or the whatever that identifies them as a special operations uh, careerist. The other 40,000 are people who are in for a tour or two over the course of their careers, and we depend very, very heavily on them, and they gain an expertise that, uh, that becomes quite important to us. Uh, but that's 60,000 people growing some. Uh, but I'm on record as now four years in a row before the Congress is saying we should probably grow about 3% a year uh, to meet the nation's growing need for us, but we ought not grow more than 5% a year because we'll lose our soul uh, along the way. We are a, a, a community that depends on knowledge of each other. We do grow up together. Almost everybody I work with at my level I've known for 15 or 20 years or more. And that's, that's very important to have the, the maturity of action that I think the nation uh, expects from us. Our budget has grown, our, our forces doubled in size, it's, our budget's about tripled, and, uh, and we are now just about, a, just about a $10 billion command. $10 billion is a lot of money. It's 1.6% of the Department of Defense's budget. The, uh, the services invest about another 1.6% in it, so the nation's buying its special operations force for around 3.5% of its budget, and, and we frankly think we're a pretty good deal. Um, our, our, our over... <laughs> our overseas deployments have quadrupled along the way. We have about uh, 13,000 members of our force deployed on any given day. Um, if you just take the sum total of a force, Army, oh. Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Special Operations, uh, we are deployed every day at a much higher rate uh, than anyone else. We're designed to be that. We don't operate bases or airfields or gyms. We don't have bands. We don't have any of that kind of stuff. We're, we're, we're designed to be deployed because we live in many ways off the services. Um, but, uh, but that does create a pressure over time on our force, and uh, we're starting to see it. We're starting to see the force. I, I was quoted a few months ago saying we're beginning to fray around the edges. Fabric's strong. Weave is tight. Uh, but we're asking an awful lot of our people, we're asking an awful lot of their families, and there's no solution to this. There's, uh, because even when and if uh, we begin to wind down in our current campaigns, and by the way, I'll, I'll say that 100,000 people came out of Iraq before the first special operations person came out, and of the 33,000 people announced to come out of Afghanistan over the next year, none of them uh, will be special operations. So uh, even as, as we do begin to come out, we are, we are deploying 85% of our force uh, from the United States. 85% of what goes overseas goes into the Central Command area of operation we're covering the world with the other 15%. So there's pent up demand. And as we begin to come out of CENTCOM, uh, there will be a lot of work to catch up on around the rest of the world. So our force is not gonna be sort of standing around with its hands in its pockets uh, anytime soon. And, uh, and we do know that whether we're asking someone to, to leave their home base to train in Alaska or fight in Afghanistan or train uh, the Sri Lankans, uh, they're still away from home. And so we're, we're asking an awful lot of our, of our families as well and, and trying to find the thousand ways uh, that it's going to take uh, to deal with that. But we are, we are programmed to grow a little bit more and, uh, and along the way hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to, to just sort of reduce that pressure around the edges. And, and yet it's clear from the drawdown plans that the President has in Afghanistan, the fact that Special Operations Forces will not be coming out during that drawdown, 
that the demand on you in the future will be extraordinary. John Brennan the other day was saying, going forward, we will be mindful that if our nation is threatened, our best offense won't always be deploying large armies abroad, but rather delivering targeted surgical pressure to the groups that threaten us. That's you. It's clear that the United States is headed for a position of, uh, of counterterrorism rather than large conventional armies, and rather, I might add to me, from my vantage point, counterinsurgency, uh, which has many, many, many troops, very large bu budgets, and over the last few months in Washington, with that perspective of Afghanistan and Washington, it's clear they don't really talk about coin very much. I mean, they may be doing it in certain regions in Afghanistan, but not all over. That means back at you. The counterterrorism troops, the counterterrorism approach, do you believe will be the future? And if so, how do we balance the American military? Uh, counterterrorism approach without counterinsurgency is a flawed <laughs> concept, and counterinsurgency without counterterrorism is flawed concept. This idea of just being able to sort of wait over the horizon and spring into uh, to chop off heads just doesn't really work. What it requires is, um, and forgive me, I don't mean to sound weird on you here, but um, but I'm, I'm beginning to think of it as the yin and the yang of special operations. And, and if the yin is our counterterrorism capability, and, and you all are tuned in somewhat to that, then the Yang is our engagement force. Most of our force is doing that on most days. 60 countries or so around the world, we are engaged. We are developing long-term relationships. We are gaining an understanding of a micro region. We're learning the languages. We're meeting the people. We're studying the histories. Uh, we're, we're learning the black markets. We're learning the, you know, how things really happen in those places. Because if you don't know that, uh, you can't be an effective counterterrorist force. You have to know where to go, who's who, not only who the good bad guys are, but who the good guys are. And all this is part of the counterterrorism uh, network. It's, uh, it's a network that's digital and it's a network that's human. And, uh, and so, and we do both sides. We do the yin and the yang uh, within the special operations community. And there is yin and the yang and yang and the yin. You can't be a counterterrorism force if you're not partnered at some level and you can't be the engagement force if you're not able to get into a fight uh, at some level because that happens. And these two are really coming together. Um, they're, 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 they, they are demonstrated in Afghanistan, I think, where the counterterrorism line of operation and the engagement line of operation, what's being called village stability operations and the development of Afghan local police trying to return neighborhoods back to the neighbors, um, are both led by special operations forces and they rely very heavily on each other. The counter-terrorist guys, before they will run a raid, they'll find out who the other special operations guy, who or whoever, uh, is in that area and who can help coach them through what it takes uh, to run that mission, because otherwise they're fumbling around in the dark and, uh, and we really, they really need that level of understanding. So that is the big change for us. And, and if I can just, this is good. This, um, I'm now sometimes showing a, a slide of the photograph of the world at night. You know, when I've, you've all seen it where the world, the lights are on somewhere in the world and, and our pre-911 thinking was that the strategically important places on earth was the relatively narrow band of the northern hemisphere where all the lights are. Our money's made there, people live there, goods are produced there, our friends and our enemies were all within that relative band. But post-911 it's much further south and it's where the lights aren't. And, uh, and we found ourselves as a nation relatively unprepared to operate in those areas. But, uh, but it's essential that we do, uh, that we understand those places. And by the way, we don't have a history of military to military relationships with many of those uh, countries. And so we have to build those. And when you talk about what's next, I think that's it. And it does rely heavily on us. These are countries that don't want a brigade of infantry to come into their country. They want a handful of people who can come in and, uh, and provide them some help. It's, it's much better if another nation solves its own problems, uh, but there's some ways that we can help them do that. J just one quick last question on Afghanistan and counterterrorism. What if we didn't have those big forward operating bases there? What if it was just strictly counterterrorism? What would happen? Um, the, the strategy of 
of clear, hold, build, transition is a valid strategy, but it takes forces to clear, and you can't clear with small teams. It takes forces to hold, and you can't hold with small teams. Um, and you can't build unilaterally, so you've got to have partners uh, in the other nation. And, and then the sequen the timing of that's very important. You shouldn't clear if you're not ready to hold, and you shouldn't hold if you're not ready to build. Um, and so that does require some broader force than a counterterrorism force operating, you know, from a from a micro post. Uh, and I think that we could be very effective in identifying who the real bad guys are and conducting capture or kill operations against them. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're keeping other bad guys from occupying space. And so it does require, I'm not an expert on how much force it takes to do that, but it does take a some. Lot. <laughs> it sure does take expert. some beyond uh, a pure counter-terrorist capability. I, I just wanted, before we open up questions to all of you, do a quick around the world, if we could, in terms of other hot spots, and if we could start with Yemen. And what you're seeing there, and I know you're not gonna talk about special operations forces there, <laughs> but I hear they're around there. I have it on good authority, not from him, obviously. Uh, and, and what you can say about the threat from, from Al-Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula. If you... And al Laki if And you our look, search for him. Yeah. If, <laughs> and who's doing it? If, if, you look, <laughs> if you look at sort of the Times Square would-be bomber and the, the Detroit underwear would-be bomber and the teenager in Portland and the toner cartridges and those things that have come up on our scope as intended attacks on the United States, uh, those are not traceable back to where the lights are. They're traceable back to Yemen and Somalia and places that, uh, that you're hearing about an increasing Al-Qaeda presence. These are becoming the new safe havens. They are undergoverned spaces, wide open. Training camps can develop there. People can move there. Things can be smuggled there and uh, in and out. And, uh, and so I, I think this is, um, this is an increasing area of concern for us. And uh, again, sort of back in my special operations role, I would say that um, as proud as we are of, of our ability to respond to the sound of guns, uh, we're at least as proud of of what it is we do to move ahead of the sound of guns and try to prevent that from occurring by getting the knowledge, establishing the relationships and coaching other people uh, through their own problems so that we don't have to have such a large presence later. I mean, I don't think anybody wants to open a third front uh, in the war on terror. So if we can help another nation solve its problems with a much smaller force, then it's, it's uh, to all of our advantage to do that and special operations plays, plays that role. Um. It, it, just a little bit more on Yemen, if we can. I saw with my own eyes special operations forces training Yemeni. How do you know? I'm, I'm not sure unless they were Yemenis dressed up as, as blonde, blue-eyed guys, okay, <laughs> with kind of scruffy beards. But I could be wrong. I, I could be totally wrong. Why don't we talk about any of that? I mean, particularly since Yemen has been pretty cooperative. Why do we have to be secretive about this constantly? I won't go country by country, but I'll tell you that, you know, if you've, if you've seen how one country treats an American presence, you've seen how one country treats an American presence. Uh, they are all different. The politics are nuanced in every place that we go, and mostly we yield to another nation's sensitivities. Um, I had a great conversation with the head of a, of a country's military a few years ago, and I said, look, we can scale it to any level of visibility we want. We can be from invisible to very high profile. And he said, no, I think, I think low profile is good. I said, okay, no one will know we're here. He goes, I didn't say invisible, I just said low profile. <laughs> he wanted intelligence agents from other countries to know that we were in his country and that, and that he was working with American forces at that level. Uh, so it's all, it's all very delicately done. So when you, the simple question, the answer is why don't we talk more about it? Uh, it's because, in many cases, our access depends on our ability to not talk about it. And, uh, we have so also we reported on, uh, a lot of people have reported on the, the raid just days after the successful bin Laden raid where Alaki got away. And 
our reporting was, as, as others, there were three missile strikes that didn't hit him. Uh, talk about I, I, whatever you can about that, which I'm sure is. Um, <laughs> and if you will, talk about the threat from al -Laki. I think a lot of reporters here have been told again and again that he is considered one of the number one threats, if not the number one threat to the United States and our interests overseas. Is that simply because he knows American soft spots, he understands our culture, he knows that some laws in the U.S. might prohibit things that U.S. laws don't prohibit elsewhere. Talk about that threat and, and really what it is exactly why he is such a huge threat. And, and I would assume that you don't believe he's planning huge catastrophic attacks. It's more like you talked about, homegrown recruits, smaller attacks. Um, a lot he's a threat because he wants to be and he has the capability to be. He's, um, he's a savvy guy. He's, uh, he knows how to hide from us pretty well, uh, despite the fact that he's communicating with his own people pretty well. You know, he's publishing a magazine in the English language that's quite Inspired. frightening. Uh, he's a dual passport holder and uh, who has lived in the United States, so he understands us much better than we understand him. And, and that's sort of as I look ahead at Al-Qaeda version 2.0, I see more Iraqis and fewer, uh, fewer sort of cave dwellers, if you will. Better than we understand him, that's not exactly making me feel good. <laughs> But, but can you just elaborate a tiny bit on, on that threat? I mean, a lot of people want to kill us. A lot of people might be inspired by going after Americans, but his unique capability is what? I think success brings more success. And uh, he's a charismatic guy, and he's got the street creds of having lived in the United States, of having at least attempted uh, some missions that got relatively far along compared to others. Uh, and, and in that environment, success breeds more success. You start to attract like-minded thinkers. You start to attract money uh, to your cause. And so the more successful he is, the more successful he will be. And Somalia and the connection between Somalia and Yemen, it almost seems as if Yemen or Al-Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula is planning the operations and going to Somalia for the troops. Yeah, Shabab. I think, I think more training is taking place in Somalia than Yemen, and, uh, and there are recruits being trained in Somalia who we know are f moving into Yemen soon after. So uh, there, is a, there is an invisible bridge between the two. And the recent arrest, Orsami, can you talk about that? <laughs> okay, at this point, I was, I'm happy to turn. Leslie Stahl, can you, can you try? <laughs> Um, I'd love to open it up to questions. Okay, okay. perfect. Well, let's and actually, can, can everybody except Leslie Stahl, who, who needs no introduction, introduce themselves before they, they ask a question, and I will call on you. Okay, well, you had talked about the dozen missions. Uh, I don't think many of us realized how many missions uh, your forces, the special forces, are performing uh, so often. Uh, do you go, and you had talked about how the lessons learned 31 years ago, I mean, not, that had been incorporated a long time ago. Do you, on these missions, uh, are they planned the same way the Osama bin Laden one was with backup helicopters with that much uh, care in each case? Can you give us a little more on all these dozens of missions every week? They're all planned differently, and a force is selected according to the, the mission needs. and. Uh, but in almost every case, there is a quick reaction force on call to render assistance should things go bad. There is medical capability uh, on call uh, to render medical assistance should things go bad. And there are all the follow-on plans, what you do with the people you capture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, these are now, I would say, I don't mean to overstate this, but they're, they're conducted from a template that is quite well rehearsed, and they deviate from the template for for all of these missions based on the priority of the target, the where it is, what it takes to get there, what they expect to, uh, to see there when they arrive. But, um, but it happens 
multiple times a night. Frequent raids into Pakistan? No, yes. No, I'm, I'm clear about that. There are not frequent raids into Pakistan. Stuart Bernstein, thank you for your service. I had the great honor to serve my country as the American ambassador to Denmark, and part of that preparation was spending a day down at Fort Bragg with the special forces. Amazing. And what occurred to me was that these were very highly educated, uh, married, uh, dedicated, couldn't wait to see action. Can you give us a little more background of who these guys are and, and how they, what, what do you do that gets them so uh, committed and, and so, and so uh, wonderful and dedicated to what they do? I, I think they come to us that way. We just build on it. Uh, anybody who's worried about the future of America based on the youth they see, they're just not seeing the same youth I'm seeing. Our recruiting is as high as it's ever been. They're staying with us because they're generally doing what it is they came in to do. They are innovative, they're um, tenacious. Um, I think we can describe them all as um, problem solvers. Uh, and they find that they are in an environment that suits them well uh, once they get through the, uh, once they cross the bed of hot coals it takes uh, to get into any of our specialized units. Uh, we are about 30% college graduates in our enlisted community. That's extraordinary uh, in our force. We average about 30 years old in our special forces A teams and our SEAL platoons compared to an infantry platoon that averages about 20 years old. We're about 70% married uh, as compared to the rest of the force. It's about 30%. Uh, married and so these are people who are and I don't mean to sound too periphery here But they are I mean the data will show you they're more intelligent. They're more Determined they have volunteered more times passed through more Filters to do what it is they're doing and then they just find that it suits them uh, Our retention rates for of if you take across our force all the people who could choose to get out or stay in 82% are choosing to stay in. That's an extraordinarily high uh, retention rate. Yeah. So it, it is Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps. Uh, we were born three quarters joint, but we got our Marine Corps team about five years ago. So now we're four quarters joint and we can be awful proud of, of what all these are doing. I would say um, you know, I'm, I'm not proud of everyone every day, uh, but the end, at the end of every month I look back and it's a force to be incredibly, uh, in, incredibly proud of. Um, when people ask me what my job is like, I, I say, well, okay, I, and I just, this, I'm, I'm kind of saying this for the first time, but um, it's, it's kind of like President Karzai. There's a lot of warlord management uh, <laughs> in, in, in my job. I have a, Army commander, a Navy commander, an Air Force commander, a Marine Corps commander, a joint commander, they all have their own tribes and sub-tribes. <laughs> and, uh, and at the end of the day, it's a paella, and at the end of the day, it tastes pretty good, but it is tough to put it together sometimes. And, and there's, there are healthy rivalries, and there's great cooperation, and it all just kind of works because like-minded people. And then the other guy I would compare my, my job to is sort of George Steinbrenner 10 years ago. If you if you are able to hire the right people and get them good equipment and good training, you're going to win a lot of games. And, uh, and, that's, and that's the special operations community. Can, can you just say briefly, you, d you did say there is some fraying. Are you seeing in the community after 10 years, are you seeing that in divorce? In, I, I mean, while retention's fantastic, has that been reduced at all? Suicides? How, how is that ma manifesting itself? It's up in all of those. It's less up in those than in the rest of the force, but we're seeing increases in those within our force. Um, and and the, the response lags the data, the data lags the reality, and the data doesn't collect what it is is really important to us in every case. So uh, we've sent out sensing teams to all of our units and peers being asked about their peers, subordinates being asked about their bosses, uh, wives being asked about their husbands, kids being asked about their dads, to really figure out what this is because we see a lot of separations short of divorce and you don't collect that in the data. 
we got people who are too busy to get divorced, or as a matter of convenience, they're deciding not to live together, but they're going to have the spouse still use the exchange and the medical. I mean, this is happening across our force, and, and it, not, not in huge numbers. I'm not panicked about it. Uh, but I do want to be ahead of this. I want to be proactive, not reactive to it. Um, my sense is that we're 10 years into this. And about right now, about 60% of our force has come in since 911. And they were inspired for whatever reason to come in and, and for whatever additional reason to come serve with us. They knew it was going to be hard. They knew it was going to be meaningful. And now they've done it for six or seven years. They answered most of their own goals uh, that they had when they came in. And keeping them now, and, and, but they see 10 more years of it. Uh, ahead of them. And so this is a very, very important time I think we're in right now as we reach the 10-year anniversary of this in a career where we hope that everybody will stay 20 years uh, or more. So where we are seeing people leave the community, uh, where we're below 82, or where, where we're, you know, what brought us down to 82 percent is exactly there. It's at the nine, ten years of service. We're seeing our enlisted E6s starting to leave. We're seeing our officer O4s uh, starting to leave, our majors and our sergeants first class. And, uh, and, and it's because now they have the family, they have other goals. And, uh, and so we've got to nurture this very, very carefully. So again, we've, we've uh, sensed it, and now it's what do we do about it now that we've collected this sense. And we're just in that phase right now. I, I suspect it's hard being in special operations, or particularly a SEAL, and coming out afterwards, and, and that adrenaline. I mean, do, you, do you have sort of the adrenaline junkies that you really have to watch? Well, I, th I think you do, and, and I... We'll keep our eye on you, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I, I think um, our people are risk managers by nature. And we help them manage risk in the operational environment, but an awful lot of them are doing adventure sports, extreme kinds of behaviors on their own time. Frankly, we don't discourage that at all. We think that, uh, that living by one's wits is a, is, a, is a good conditioning experience. And so, uh, and, and so we do see that kind of behavior. Uh, it hasn't manifested itself in negative ways very often, but... Um, but we did, for example, have one of our great Marines killed uh, doing base jumping in Switzerland uh, a couple of weeks ago. And if you know what base jumping, I mean, this is jumping off a cliff um, to, to pull a parachute. And, uh, and so we, and, but we also had, I think, the guy who took third place in the ultimate fighting championships uh, last week was, a, was an Army Green Beret. So, uh, so we do see that kind of behavior, but, but I, don't, I don't think it's especially risky. Over here. Just hang on for that microphone. My name is Kent Blackmer, and I'm representing the public transportation system in the area. And my question to you is, when you talk about being in the ground in these countries and finding out who the bad guys are and who's legitimate and not legitimate with this kind of instability in the Middle East, how do you go in there and know What's legitimate, how you should help, and, and what groups you should be supporting? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very delicate thing, and that's why we really depend on mature people uh, to do this. You, you sort of have to earn your way to a position where you're one of the first people in, uh, because it's easy to do the wrong things. And so um, they're careful observers, they're good note takers, they're good analysts, and they feel their way in to this. I mean, one of my messages is, if you want us to do something um, next January, don't tell us in December. Tell us now. Uh, because it takes time to do. You can do a counter-terrorist raid overnight, uh, but it takes years to do what it is you're talking about to really gain the sense of a place. And that's why it's very important for us to be out in the world living by our wits and sensing these, uh, these places. I, I will quote one of my foreign counterparts in a time of friction between our nation and his. And he said, uh, he said, we should never let the politics of the day get in the way of a good military to military relationship. Where we have done that, we have always paid a price, wished that we had never left, lost our contact uh, with military leaders in that place, didn't know who to call. And so then when you get something like an Arab Spring, 
Some places you can call and talk to the leaders, and some places you can't because we just backed away from that country uh, for whatever for whatever reason. So it's it's a very delicate, sensitive thing, and we just count on good people to do it. Dina. Dina. I'm Dina Temple Raston with National Public Radio. Um, a question I had for you has to do with uh, the kinds of operations that you're doing. I think the numbers, when you say that you're doing dozens every day, I think that surprised just about all of us. So uh, are the operations more like, instead of an Osama bin Laden operation, which is quite complex, is it something more like the Nab Han operation that you had in Somalia, in which basically you know where someone is, you send in the team with a helicopter, you get him and you get out? Are those the kinds of operations that you're doing dozens of times a day? We're, we're a broadly dispersed force, and we are a finishing force. I mean, the, um, so often it is relatively rapidly developing information. It's because you're living in a place, somebody in that place tells you who's planning to set off an IED the next day. So you run a raid that night, knock on his door, and capture him. And that hap that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about that happens uh, over and over. You're talking in, about Afghanistan, the majority I'm talking about Afghanistan, Afghanistan yeah. yeah. It's all, I'm talking, when I say the dozen, majority of, dozen you know, a night, it's, when, uh, when I say 11 went, that night, 11 went left. Uh, I mean, I'm talking all in Afghanistan and, and still uh, in Iraq. Uh, but we're not, we're not running missions like that around the world. What we're doing around the rest of the world is training, advising, assisting. In many cases, um, we're providing very meaningful assistance short of combat advising, but we meet the people, we, we, we train foreign counterparts, uh, pat them on the back as they go off to conduct their missions and then welcome them back off their missions and, uh, and help them get ready to go again. Hi, my name is Sarah Sewell. Um, Admiral Olson, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the role of women in the Special Forces and where you see that role evolving in the future. Um, we have female operators within the Special Operations community. We don't have nearly enough, and we're too late bringing them into, into what it is we have them doing. There are not female SEALs. There are not female Green Berets. There are not female Rangers. There are not female Marine... Uh, special operators because the, uh, the, the combat exclusion uh, policy prevents that. But we do have female information specialists, female civil affairs specialists. We have created over the last year or so, it's a terrible name I know, but we call them cultural support teams. And these are teams of two to four women who are attached uh, to a SEAL team or a Green Beret, uh, uh, ODA, uh, Operational Detachment sort of in remote places in the middle of nowhere. They're conducting female shuras, uh, leader meetings in those areas. They are um, able to connect with the half of the population that we weren't able to connect to previously. Um, in the more kinetic side of it, where they're not going on the operational mission itself, but they're going on to the target after the target is secure. They're talking to the women, finding cell phones in places where no man would ever find them. I mean, that kind of thing that uh, that, that, is that is very, very helpful to us. And uh, they're volunteering, we're selecting them, we're training them, not all of them make it through the training, and then we're, we're getting them out the door. We graduated 56 last week, uh, all of whom will be in, uh, in Afghanistan by the end of August. Okay, now this isn't classified. Do you see a day when women are in the combat role with the SEALs possible? Like to see that happen? No, I would. I, I mean, I, I certainly think that, um, as, as soon as policy permits it, we will be ready to, to go down that road. And you would go right up there and say, yes, sir, they could do them? They could do this? Same. I mean, the, the, I don't think the idea is to select GI Jane and put her through SEAL training. Um, but there are a number of things that a man and woman can do together that two guys can't. There are places they can go, things that they can, the, just the way they present themselves. And I think female operators in those roles are very important. It will require very special women who are carefully selected and highly trained to do that. I don't think it's as important that they can do a lot of push-ups. It's much more, it's much more important uh, sort of what they're made of and whether or not they have the, uh, the, the courage and the intellectual agility to, to do that. Thanks, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Admiral, could you just, I'm gonna switch lanes here a little bit. Could you give us an update, if there is an update to be given, with regards to piracy on the high seas? And um, do I read less about it because I have you and your teams to thank? Or um, have things just settled down a little bit there? The, the big difference, the reason you're hearing less about it is because countries decided to group together to deal with policy. And there is a, a maritime task force that is international in nature that is patrolling the area that has had some success, including deterrent effect. And so I think there is just less of that happening. Also, the shipping industry itself has learned lessons. They've learned where the safer routes are. They've learned uh, techniques that will discourage pirates from, uh, from boarding their ships. The pirates themselves now have to go further off the coast, and it requires more sophisticated equipment and better training, et cetera, et cetera, to do that. So I think we're just seeing piracy made harder uh, for the pirates. And in the rare occasion where a ship is really seized, underway, held captive at sea, then special operations may or may not be part of the solution. A couple of times it has been. Yes, sir. My name is Gary Lauder. A uh, question. Um, the military is today mostly fighting people with bad ideas. Um, and, uh, and so the question is, to what extent does our government misallocate resources in fighting ideas uh, with violence rather than fighting ideas with ideas? Um, the military is, in, is uniquely positioned to um, help our government reprioritize if it thought that it should. So I'm curious to get your thoughts on that subject. Yeah, I think mostly bad ideas are just ones that we don't agree with. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and they think the same thing about us. Um, it is a reality that the Department of Defense has more mass and more money than any other organization in our government. We are more expeditionary than anybody can be. And so sometimes I think the military takes on roles that in a perfect world would not be a military solution. I think in many cases this battle of ideas uh, sort of escalates beyond simply an information campaign because it, it's a military, it becomes a military operation. Um, so I'm all in favor of other elements of our government becoming more expeditionary and being able to, to deal with those before it requires a military solution. Uh, I think that um, also, in general, and back to a previous point, people know more about us than we know about them. We're not very good in the initial bouts of a, you know, of a war of ideas. I'm going to have one last question, and Walter? You're not taking my mic. Uh, you, you very interestingly talked about how you and the CIA work together so well, and especially you and um, uh, Mr. Panetta. Uh, with General Petraeus coming into the CIA and the CIA taking on more operational roles that seem to be more military in nature, do you think that the special operations in the Defense Department, where Mr. Panetta will now be going, and the CIA will have to evolve their relationship so it's almost more of a unified command? Yeah, you know, I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I, I think that, you know, the authorities are very much different. And, uh, and if you look at the authorities under which the CIA operates and you look at the authorities under which the military operates, there is a fuzzy area between them. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're about to cross, you know, if you're about to get on a, on a subway in London, there's a little sign there that says, Mind of the Gap. And, uh, and what we have between CIA authorities and traditional military activities is a gap. And, and it's special operations that has sort of evolved into filling that role. I think it's pretty interesting that the only recommendation of the 911 Commission that was not implemented was that United States Special Operations Command uh, be the lead for paramilitary operations in the United States. We didn't support that, and, uh, and others didn't. And so the uh, the CIA retained that role, and it's very appropriate they do that. But there is capability that we can contribute, and uh, and at times we do that. And uh, and so I, I think the relationship is really 
in a, in a very good place now. I think the, um, the habits that we've developed in working with each other are, are pretty good ones. I don't see why that wouldn't continue uh, through, the change of, uh, through, through the change of leadership. Uh, John Petraeus is not the first former military guy to run CIA, and Director Panetta is, you know, Secretary Panetta is not the first uh, former CIA guy to run the Department of Defense. Uh, the fact that they're doing it at the same time is interesting, but, um, but this is a great working relationship. Thank you so much. I want to ask you. <laughs> hang on just one second. You can all stand up in a second. I just want to ask you one last time, just for your mom, okay? <laughs> what it was like sitting there watching when you figured you had him, when, when Geronimo was gone. What went through your mind as you're closing your career? This great success you had. Just keep thinking of your mom. You didn't, we'll, we'll send her the transcript right away. She's probably home streaming the video, we hope. For the record, my mother was told by a lot of other people, uh, and I still haven't talked to my mother about that. Um, and I think I've been sort of, uh, I'm not welcome in Tacoma because, I mean, actually I, I am, but, um, but I have to tell a story about someone who asked me why I really like Mexican food. <laughs> and I said, where did you hear that I like Mexican food? <laughs> and they said, well, we saw you were a taco man. Oh. And, and <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you read Tacoman, <laughs> <laughs> you get taco man. Okay, enough about that. Um, here's what you're thinking when, when, you're, when you, at the moment we knew, um, bin Laden was dead. My thought was, what's, ne what's the next item on the checklist? I mean, this is, th that's, that's all it is. That's such a bad answer, really. <laughs> that's but, it? But it is. It is. I mean, obviously, obviously you're pleased, but um, I think that anybody in this business this long is conditioned to but bin Laden. the next, okay. the, the very okay. next... <laughs> the very next thing can go wrong. And uh, are we going to get anybody hurt? What equipment are we leaving behind? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think all thoughts went, that was done, and then, then you're on to the next thing. I'm not sure everybody saw it that way. <laughs> but but I, have to, I have to say I did. Thank you, sir. And as your mother said, also in this article, everyone should appreciate someone who spends their entire career making the rest of us safe. Thank right, you, thank sir. You, thank you very much. Enjoy.